You'll find a text in 1 Samuel if you turn there with me this morning. And it is good to be in the house of the Lord and gathered with God's people. And I appreciate that kind of singing. Straight from Pensacola. I uh, appreciate that arrangement. I'm getting all my notes in order here. And, uh, I got a whole lot to say to the compromiser this morning. Amen. Music purists get nervous when they go to singing those kind of songs. And they get real critical of that. I'd be careful about criticizing that kind of music right there. I'd be real careful. I'm against contemporary music and, and worldly sounding music. But I'm against dead music too. And I have just as strong a conviction against the dead stuff. You go to some churches, honest to God, the surround mouth, you'd think it's a lion on the Wizard of Oz singing every time you get up there. Somebody help me now. I appreciate the way Dr. Treber's unapologetic about that too. He doesn't have to ask your permission what he's going to sing and how he's going to sing it. Thank God. That's a man with a backbone right there. And I'm so under conviction, it's hard to preach. I, I, I didn't get a mug last night. And... Uh, this, I know, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> I felt guilty. And uh, I watched, just a few mugs were passed out. I went this morning, drank coffee, no mug. <laughs> and the Holy Ghost hit me again. And then he passed the envelopes out a while ago. And I really want us to pray about that. There, how many pastors are here? Would you stand to your feet if you're a pastor of a church? A pastor of a church. How many heads of homes are here? Well, I should say husbands or daddies. That's, there's not many more husbands or daddies than that in here. Men. How many men are here that have a job? Okay. The rest of you freeloaders, we don't want none of your money anyway. I want you to pray about between now and tonight. Between now and tonight, what you could do every month to help the, the college. I, I've prayed about it. I, I got a letter a few months ago, and I put it to the trader, I intended to get, I wanted that mug. If I'd have known this giveaway mugs, I'd have done this earlier. <laughs> but I intended to start sending. So how many has ever had those good intentions? I'm gonna do it well. We're gonna talk about it later on tonight. So you can be seated. Appreciate it. Think about it, be praying about it. I want to help you, I want to communicate to you. Some people are not getting it. We're addressing a generation that ha they're not getting it, man. I mean, I don't understand why they don't get it. I heard, I heard about an older couple, and uh, the husband went out to go to the grocery store, and there came a flash across the news screen, said that on the highway there was a car driving the wrong way, I mean, just head on into multiple lanes of traffic. And she called her husband and said, Baby, said, I want to warn you, said, said uh, they just had a flash news announcement that there's somebody on the highway headed the wrong direction. He said, baby, it's not just somebody. There's hundreds of them coming the wrong direction. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> he didn't get it, man. And some people just don't, they don't, they don't get it. We're living in a generation that you, you tell them something plain and they just act, they, they just look at you. And uh, they're numb to it. I, they just start getting it. One, one hillbilly in Tennessee, uh, the IRS was coming in to check on their books and their records and finances. And the agent said, I need your passcode for your computer. Now, the hillbilly said, I can't give you that, man. He said, oh, you, you'll either give it to me or we'll arrest you. And he said, well, it's, it's Cinderella, Snow White, and uh, Daffy and Goofy, and Mickey, and Minnie, and Sacramento. And that agent said, now wait a minute. I never heard such a passcode. He said, well, they told us it had to be six characters in a capital. And uh, <laughs> he didn't get it, man. And then we've got another sect of religious community. They're not our brethren. They're those that uh, in 1 Corinthians so-call themselves brothers. 
And they're, they're leading our young people, our younger generation, in another direction. They're lying to them. They're lying to them. Beware of false prophets, Jesus said. They're going to come to you lying, man. They're trying to make, they're trying to make uh, bad trees out of good trees, bad fruit out of, out, of, out of good trees, and trying to make good fruit out of bad trees. I, it's happening all the time. They're, they're letting people rest in their sin, disobedience, and coddling them, and then trying to make the others doubt that they're doing right. They're second-guessing what we've been taught, making bad fruit. Amen. And, uh, and we're living in that hour. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm confused myself many times by what I hear and see. And uh, Jeremiah 6.16 is still there. Stand you in the ways and see and ask for the old path. Where is the good way? It's not a bad way. But they're lying to us. I heard about one aged lady who got pulled over by the state patrol. And uh, he went to the window and she rolled the window down. He said, ma'am, said, I need to see your operator's license. And she said, I ain't got one. Said, I got pulled over for DUI and they revoked my license. And he said, well, I need to see the registration and tag receipt for your car. She said, this, this ain't my car. She said, this is my neighbor's car. And said, I killed my neighbor and cut him up into pieces and put him in the trunk. Man, that, that officer got nervous and he went back and called for backup. And his supervisor came and the supervisor came up there and went to the lady's window and said, ma'am, said, I need to see your operator's license. She reached in her billfold, handed them to him. Said, I need to see your tag receipt and your registration. She reached in the glove box and handed it to him. And he said, I need to see the keys to your trunk. And she handed him the keys. He went back out and opened the trunk. He came back and nothing in the trunk, just, just a jumper cables and a spare tire and lug wrench. Boys, that's a tool that you use to change tires with. It's a lug wrench and a jack. Hey, man. Most of these boys have a flat tire. They got to call AAA. Somebody help me. And so he went back and said, ma'am, said, I don't understand this. said, this officer who pulled you over said that you didn't have a license and said that your car wasn't registered, it was stolen, and that you had murdered your neighbor and put him in the trunk. She said, yeah, he probably told you I was speeding too, didn't he? he <laughs> They're lying to us. They're lying to y'all. I'm going to read a lengthy text. I don't normally do it, but I want you to turn me to 1 Samuel chapter 15, page 334. And I won't ask you to stand because it's too long. You've got to be careful about the leaven of the Pharisees. Beware of the leaven. You don't have to wait till the loaf has come out of the oven. Phariseeism is just, uh, doesn't take much to taint the congregation. The leaven of the Pharisees. I was preaching in Gainesville, Georgia. And I announced my text, and I started reading my text, and three or four, you know, uh, the Sanhedrin jumped up on me because <laughs> they wanted to catch Brother Tony doing something wrong. And they jumped up, and what they did, they gave disrespect to the text because it threw me off guard. And I said, uh, I'm sorry. And I said, you like to stand. And they all started watching these Pharisees, and they all started following suit of the Pharisee. I said, Yo, so y'all all like to stand when you read. I said, turn to Psalms 119. <laughs> if, it was, if it was required to stand to read, we couldn't listen to preaching on the radio. <laughs> Amen. There's nothing wrong with standing, but there's nothing wrong with sitting either if you're respecting God's Word. That means turn your cell phone off while I'm preaching. Amen. <laughs> All right, here we go. Are y'all ready? Yes. Some of y'all looking like, can he preach? I'm like, can you handle it when we get down to it in just a minute? Pray for us much. 1 Samuel 15, and Samuel also said unto Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people. That happened in chapter 10, verse 1, anoint him with a vial of oil. And he said, therefore hearken unto the voice of the words of the Lord. That's a good admonition for any generation of people, lay person as well as man of God, hearken, hearken unto the words or the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for them in the way. And when he came up from Egypt, now to go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not, 
but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. And Saul gathered the people together and numbered them and tell me 200,000 footmen and 10,000 men of Judah. That's a pretty good liking. That's a pretty good following. That's a pretty good crowd. And Saul came to the city of Amalek and laid in wait in the valley. And Saul said unto the Kenites, Go depart ye and get down from among the Amalekites, and lest I destroy you with them, for ye showed kindness to all the children of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites. Saul smote the Amalekites from Havilah until it cometh to Shur that is over against Egypt. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen of the fatlings and the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. But everything that was vile and refuse, they, uh, that they did destroy utterly. Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he is turned back from following me, and hath not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. And when Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set up a place and is gone about and passed on and gone to Gilgal. Samuel said to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Let me say that was a false profession. Partial obedience is not obedience. Delayed obedience is not obedience. And Samuel said, What meaneth then this bleeding of the sheep in mine ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear. And Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. Then Samuel said unto Saul, Stay, and I will tell thee what the Lord hath said to me this night. And he said unto him, Say on. And Samuel said, When thou was little in thine own sight, wast thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel? And the Lord anointed thee king over Israel. And the Lord sent thee on a journey and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they be consumed. Therefore thou didst thou not, wherefore? Then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil and didst evil in the sight of the Lord? Listen at Samuel right here. Listen to Saul, verse 20. And Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. And I have gone the way which the Lord sent me. And I have brought Agag, the king of uh, Amalek, and I have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people, the people took of the spoil and the sheep and oxen, the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned, and I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and thy words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now therefore I pray thee, pardon my sin and turn again with me that I may worship the Lord. Let me just say, it's, it ain't that easy. Premeditated sin, listen to me friend, it's not that easy. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Psalm 66, 18 said. Watch what he decided to do. Well, Samuel said, I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord hath rejected thee from being king over Israel. And Samuel turned about to go, and, and he laid hold on the skirt of his mantle and rent it. And Samuel said unto him, The Lord hath rent the kingdom of Israel from thee this day, and hath given it to a neighbor of thine, that is better than thou. And also the strength of Israel will not lie nor repent, for he is not a man that he should repent. 
Then he said, I have sinned, yet honor me. I have sinned, yet honor me. I pray thee before the elders of the people really make me look good in front of these people. And before Israel, and turn again with me that I may worship the Lord thy God. So Samuel turned again after Saul, and Saul worshiped the Lord. And then Samuel then said, Samuel, bring ye hither me Agag, the king of the Amalekites. And Agag came unto him delicately. And Agag said, surely the bitterness of death is past. But he was wrong. If God said destroy him, he meant destroy him. And Samuel said, as thy sword hath made women childless, so shall thy mother be childless among women. And Samuel hewed Agag in pieces before the Lord in Gilgal. Then Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went up to his house at Gibeah of Saul. And Samuel came no more to see Saul until the day of his death. Nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul. And the Lord repented that he had made Saul king over Israel. Now, verse chapter 16, verse 1, And the Lord said unto Samuel, Now, how long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil, and go, and I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite. For I have provided me a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hear it, he'll kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with thee, and say, I am come to sacrifice to the Lord. And call Jesse to the sacrifice, and I'll show thee what thou shalt do. And thou shalt anoint unto me him whom I name unto thee. Samuel said, uh, Samuel did that which the Lord spake, and came to Bethlehem, and the elders of the town trembled at his coming, and said, Comest thou peaceably? And he said, Peaceably. I come to sacrifice unto the Lord. Sanctify yourselves, and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and called them to the sacrifice. And it came to pass that when they uh, were come that he looked on Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before me. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance, nor on the height of his statue, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as a man seeth. For a man looketh on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. Let me stop and say parenthetically, I'm not going to preach on it, but that's not a license for us to look any way we want to look. You know, we're not trying to win God. God don't need winning. We're trying to win the world. The world looks on us. That's good preaching. I left my pipe at home, but I would say put that in your pipe and smoke it. Amen. Hey, and by the way, if God can see on the inside, you know good and well he can see the outside as well. Watch me, and I'm going to try to preach. I'll pray. And Jesse called Abinadad and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, Neither hath the Lord chosen him. And then Jesse said to Shammah to pass by. And he said, Neither hath the Lord chosen him. And again, Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel. And Samuel said unto Jesse, The Lord hath not chosen these. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Are all here thy children? Are here all thy children? And he said, There remaineth yet the youngest, and behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch for him, for we will not sit down until he come hither. Our Heavenly Father, I need your touch tonight, this morning, and I, I realize we're in perilous times. We're in a Laodicean church age. It seems as though they're clothed but they're naked they're blind but they think they see they have need of nothing we're living in a day of apostasy a day of apathy uh, lord jesus i pray for a supernatural touch this morning and uh, i pray for every single listener here conscious enough to make application of these truths help us not to leave these walls today as we entered i pray we'd leave here with determination to stand until the king comes Lord, we're living in a day and hour where it seems like many have become comfortable in a lethargic, lackadaisical display of service. But Lord, I pray you'd raise us up. You said, whatsoever hand finds us, do it with all our might. And help us in light of the soon return, the imminent return of our Savior, to serve with intensity until the trumpet sounds. I stand with the arm of flesh has failed me, and the arm of flesh will fail me. 
And I yield myself to you the best way I know how, from the top of my head to the sole of my feet, it's my desire to please you. So fill me now with unction and power that man cannot provide. And for results that we see, even present results as well as those results that'll be in eternity, we'll give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory for it, for we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. When I read chapter 15, I read an episode in the life of Samuel, this great prophet, and it, it brings us to a day that parallels with our day. You read that story, if you want to turn back with me, and we'll look at a few verses in 15, where we see it was a day of refusal, a day of refusal. God had given direct orders, and there was a refusal, a refusal of Saul. When he had direct orders of God, Saul refused to submit to the will of God. It was an outlined plan. It was a detailed plan. There was no room for speculation. There was no room for human reasoning. There was no room for human reasoning. There was no room for human rationale. But it was a dictated plan. Here's what you're going to do. You're going to go down to the Malachites and you're going to utterly destroy everything down there king included, every one of them, kill every sacrifice. Don't, don't try to come in here and try to make something spiritual that's not spiritual. You're going to have to obey me. But he refused that. He refused it. Saul refused. I see it's a day where Samuel refused. He refused to surrender. God had already said, okay, he's crossed the line. Though I anointed him, I used you, I put my approval on him. We anointed him with a vial of oil. And we're going to use, I was going to use him, but, but he would not, he would not submit to the perfect will of God, to the plan of God. He wanted to manipulate the plan. Just tweak it just a little. He wasn't too far off, but he wasn't on. But it bothered Samuel. I mean, that Samuel about grieved him. I mean, he cried and cried. And verse 6, chapter 1, verse 16, he said, how long are you going to mourn for him? I have rejected him. That's the day we were in. It was a day of rejection, a day of refusal. Saul had refused to submit. Samuel had refused to surrender. Even, even a sovereign God had refused to sanction the actions of Israel. Let, let, me, let me help you just a minute. Just because somebody says they're one of God's men doesn't mean they are. A lot of things that have church on the title, and by the way, if they're going the other way, it won't be long until they won't have church on the title anyway. There, there are some elements that constitute a church. Amen, friend. There, there, there are some New Testament sanctions. There's some, there's some things that have to be there and some things that will not be there if it's approved of God. But see, the sovereign God, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, had said, no, 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 I'm not putting my stamp of approval on that crowd. We're living in that day. Days of refusal, days of denial. When he was brought, Samuel brought before Saul uh, the accusation. First thing he said, man, he said, well, I, I, I have not. Man, I've done what the Lord said. There's a denial today among some of this crowd that's leaving the old paths. They're denying that they're not fully, I'm talking about completing the plan of God. They're omitting a whole lot of things that are in the Bible. You know those things that accompany salvation. Amen. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 said, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. And behold, all things are become new. You don't, you don't do better to get saved. You get saved to do better. But there are some things that accompany salvation. The change that accompany salvation did not save you. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But that grace that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men, uh, teaching us a uh, dying ungodliness uh, and worldly lust, uh, which he said soberly uh, and righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for the blessed hope and the glory of our great God. See, they're trying, to, they're trying to partially obey. They take the parts they like. They take the positive message. But two-thirds of the pulpit responsibility is to reprove and rebuke and then exhort. Reprove, bring back to, re, to original shape. Rebuke 
a verbal, a verbal warning. We're to reprove and rebuke and then exhort. All we want, we want to, we want to heap teachers unto ourselves. Having itching ears. Scratch, scratch me right here. It feels so good. Make me feel good. Ten steps to a better self-image. Amen. What they need is the devil preached out of them. Somebody asked me the other day, said, said uh, do y'all have a wanna's at y'all's church? I said, no, because I want to preach on Sunday morning. I want to preach on Sunday night. And I want to preach on Wednesday night. Amen, friend. Hey, kids need preaching, friend. Deacon's wives need preaching. And deacon's wives need preaching. Hey, and deacon's wives need preaching. Amen. It was a day of denial. He denied. They denied full obedience, partial obedience. A denial in his confession, verse 20. Saul said unto Samuel, yea, always positive. Your liberals are always positive. They're easily approachable. They've always got a smile on their face. Reminds me of Bill Clinton. Somebody say amen. He said, yea, yes, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. And I have gone the way which the Lord sent me. Could I say right there, parenthetically, my hind leg. Saul ain't no more obeyed the voice of the Lord. Saul ain't no more went the way of God than a jaybird went. Amen. He's totally walking in disrespect. He's totally walking in rebellion. And rebellion says a sin of witchcraft. He equates that action. It's a bad day. Samuel steps on the scene in this episode in a day of denial, a day of denial of compromise. No, we, we hadn't done anything wrong. Everybody hadn't got to do it the same way. God never made a snowflake the same. Yeah, but you can't tell the difference looking at it. Somebody help me. The world can't tell a difference looking at it. There ought to be some similarities to the old time way, friend. It's a day of excusal. When he got confronted with it, it's, it's amazing how these compromisers, they always want to play the victim. I mean, you know, they're always, oh, I can't believe. I'm just trying to reach people and lift up Jesus. What about the rest of the Bible, friend? I'm just trying to reach people and lift up Jesus. What about, what about reproving and rebuking? What about calling out that brother who walks disorderly? What about marking that brother who does not follow traditions? Not the doctrines we know. We know anybody who's a heretic uh, who doesn't follow the doctrines uh, of God ought to be off limits. We ought to distance ourselves, keep no company with him. But it said even those brothers who won't even walk in the traditions we've been taught. We got a movement today within our circles who have a problem with tradition. It's preaching time. They excuse themselves. All of them's got some kind of psycho babble. I was mistreated as a child. The reason I've been on this internet pornography and the reason I've had adulterous affairs, the reason I'm a fornicator was when I was a little boy, I got mistreated. God help you, sir. Greater is he that's in you. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful. That means every time, friend. God is faithful and with every temptation. will make a way of escape. You're not looking to get out. You like it too much. He that covereth his sin shall not prosper. But he that confesseth and forsaketh shall obtain mercy. Stay in here. Well, don't leave me yet. It's all introduction. I'm going to get to the message in a minute. I'm talking about, listen, it was a day where they used their past to excuse. Well, I wasn't brought up that way and all. Neither was Saul of Tarsus. He wasn't brought up that way and all. But it didn't take him long to become old-fashioned. Amen, New Testament. Hook, line, and sinker. Amen. They use their past. They excuse it with purpose. Well, you know, well, I, the end result, they justify 
they justify the means by the end. Well, we, you know, we're, we're, we saw a lot of, you know, at least they're seeing people saved over there. First of all, I don't know that they're seeing people saved. I don't know about that. Amen. They, they don't use the word saved. Most of this, most this moderate crowd is lean. They start using the word deliverance. I got delivered. I got set free. I got delivered. What's wrong with getting born again? What's wrong with being born from above? And I got saved, and I got passed from death unto life, and I got regenerated, amen, and I got quickened, and I, and I got married to be, hey, I got engaged to be married to Jesus, and I got born from above, amen. What about I got adopted into a family? Oh, I, I, I got delivered. Sounds charismatic to me. That's charismatic talk. That's, that, that's, that's old Rod Parsley talk. By the way, you watch that crowd, they're always retweeting some kind of a tongue talker. They like some kind of a tongue talker, some kind of a, amen. Hey, sure, sure indications of a compromiser, they associate with known compromisers. They always play the victim. We're, and they always want to justify their means by the end. Now, that'd be like me going, we're going to have a citywide meeting in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, and what I want to do is bring in Dr. Treber to come preach, and we're going to bring in great singers, and what I'm going to do, we're going to rent out the Murphy Center, man, the largest uh, building and in, in a, a capacity, seating capacity in all of Rutherford County, and what I'm going to do, man, we're going, we're going to try to evangelize our city. I think it's going to be great. And uh, you pray for me, we're going to go rob a bank. <laughs> I'm going to break into the safe at the bank and get some money out so I can pay for all this. Hey, that's what they're doing. They're striving, but they're not striving lawfully. Let me tell you, friend, when you don't strive lawfully, you're not getting a blessed fired thing at the beam of seat. You're naive and you're shallow. Hey, you think you're going to hear well done? You won't hear well done if you hadn't done well. They're not striving lawfully. They're not playing by the rules. They make up their own rules and they justify, they justify those means. I don't believe God been 10,000 miles of a citywide meeting me robbing a bank to pay for it. No more than I would those today who refuse to maintain biblical principles and New Testament practices. It's always the people. Verse 21, but the people took of the spoil. You know him, people. You know the minister would be all right if it wasn't for the people. The people, Lord. This was the day. I'm going to tell you, if you can't smell 21st century, 2019, you got a spiritual problem. Anybody got the Holy Ghost can see we're living in that day. Notice what he said in verse 11 of chapter 16. The Bible said after all that was said and done, God had rejected him. And Samuel said unto Jesse, are all thy children here? And he said, yes, there remaineth yet one that beholdeth he keep the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, send and fetch him. Now notice these next few words. For we will not sit down until he come. I want to preach for the next two and a half hours on this subject. We got to keep standing until the king comes. We got to keep standing until the king comes. We will not sit down. When I look at this statement, it was a statement when you compare to stand versus to sit down. Sit down is a mentality of completion. When you sit down on the commandments of God, when you delay obedience to God, when you partially implement the ways of God, what you're doing, you're saying you're okay. We've already gone far enough. We've, rec we've reached enough. But my, my Bible said go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, every creature baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost and teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the ends of the age. There's not a person here who's ready to retire. We don't quit. We gotta stand up 
till the king comes. But there's a crowd who likes that, that lethargic. They like that, they like that nonchalant mentality. We're just gonna, you know, kind of hang out, man. We're gonna hang, you know, till Jesus comes. No, well, the king's coming. It was a statement, if you see, to sit down would represent a mentality of completion like you've already done enough. As long as there's lost people in Murfreesboro, Middle Tennessee Baptist Church has not finished the job. As long as there's lost people in, in Rutherford County, Middle Tennessee Baptist Church has not finished the job. As long as there's lost people in the metro Nashville area, Middle Tennessee hadn't finished the job. As long as there's lost people in Tennessee, Middle Tennessee hadn't finished the job. As long as there's lost people in the southeast, Middle Tennessee hadn't finished their job. As long as there's lost people, in the United States of America, Middle Tennessee hadn't finished their job. As long as there's people lost on the face of this earth, our job is not over. It ain't time to sit down. It ain't time to sit down. We're going to stand up till the king comes. To sit down is a mentality of complacency. The Bible said in Psalms 1, bless the man that walketh not the counsel of God and our standeth in the way of sinners and our sitteth in the seat of the scornful. It's, 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 it's a position of criticism. Now let me just say to you all that you're not supposed to judge and everything. Let me help you. You're, you're being strummed like a cheap banjo by somebody. He that spiritual judgeth all things. The only thing I cannot judge is the motive behind what somebody does. I can judge action. Hey man, if somebody cusses me out, I can judge. That dude just cussed me out. I'll never forget the first time a deacon cussed me out. Brother Brown, I didn't know. They, they, they didn't cover that at Liberty University where I went to college. <laughs> then I found out their wives could cuss too. Is everybody all right? But they hadn't met my wife yet. <laughs> it's not time to sit. The seat of the scornful. There's that crowd. They, they're going to continually, they're going to continually pick at our ministries. Because they've done sit down. Sometimes they'll try to console you, you know. I just don't see, I don't see how you do everything you do, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Trevor. I just don't see how one man can do all of it. Oh. It just overwhelms me. I mean, when do you sleep? <laughs> what they're doing, they're trying to make themselves feel better by telling you how good you're doing. Oh yeah, it makes them feel good to admit their failure. I, I just couldn't keep up that pace. What's sad is we've got a younger generation who think more about pleasure. I'm talking about, I'm talking about supposed to be in the ministry. No more called than a, than a, than a fox squirrel's called to preach. I ain't got enough fire to warm my chiggers feet. Somebody say amen. And all they think about is pleasure. You look at all their, all it is is Facebook. It's a deer killed or a bass caught or some vacation. How does all these young people get to go on vacation all the time? They're always on a cruise ship. They're always in their Bermuda shorts, flip flops. Amen. And that ain't the women. That's the men I'm talking about. Is everybody okay? God forbid. Amen. Let a man of God go up. A, amen, friend. We're just going to sit down. We're okay. No, we're to stand up. In contrast to sit down, I think about that word. He goes into the statement. He said, for we will not sit down until he comes. We're talking about David now. The king that he anointed in the next few verses with a vial of oil. That's Saul. But when he anointed King David, he anointed him with a horn of oil. Because there was a lengthy, I mean, David pictures the Lord Jesus Christ, friend. He's the type of our Lord and Savior. Stay with me. We will not sit down. I thought about that statement. It's a statement of allegiance. Allegiance. We've lost our loyalty. Brother Brown, I'm trying to get over it. You know, I'm trying to. I hadn't shut the door on it yet. I'm still ticked off at these people trying to steal our family trying to steal Curtis Hudson's offspring and poison them with liberalism. and I ain't got over it yet. I'm, still, I'm sold under sin. You pray for me. I'm trying to get the door shut, but my wife keeps sticking her foot in the door. Amen, friend. 
she told me to tell you, tell him I didn't get that point good. Amen. I'm sick and tired. I'm sick and tired of this disloyalty. To stand was a, was a position. It was a position of allegiance. By the way, I'm not so ticked off at Kaepernick. He's just getting ready for the millennium. Somebody say amen. Every knee will bow. Amen. And every tongue will confess. But we're to stand till the king comes. I think about that allegiance. Real. Are y'all still with me? Am I, am I okay? Is everything okay? And when I think about the allegiance, I think about allegiance to the work of God. We've been called to a divine purpose. Everybody repeat after me, divine purpose. No, you didn't say it loud enough. You didn't say, you, you, some of y'all act like homeschoolers. I said, everybody repeat after me, divine purpose. You know, I'm, I'm not in your authority chain today. Bless God. I, I, listen, I will be the rest of this week. Is everybody okay? Hey, everybody say divine purpose. Divine purpose. Yeah. It's bigger than you. It's bigger than your agenda. It's bigger than your plans for your family. By the way, the New Testament church is not some showcase for you to show off your family's talents. Amen. I had a lady going to join our church. She did all the talking. Man came down and looked like a henpecked joker standing there. And she said, well, I just want you to know we want to unite with the church. And she said, no, I'm a teacher. I said, fine. She said, but I teach adults. And I thought, you ain't going to teach a blessed fire thing around here. Is everybody okay? But number one, because your husband ain't doing much talking. Amen. Everybody okay? Hey, you think you're too good? You, you think you're above? There's a divine purpose, friend. He that's faithful in the small things, I'll make him rule over many. There was an allegiance, I think about, to the work of God. He's standing because they, here's a lengthy ministry of David who's soon to be uh, 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 initiated through this anointing, this spiritual act. And we see that he, he said there's a work to be done. There's a nation to be led. Yeah. Amen. I'm saying to you there ought to be allegiance to the work of God. Amen. There ought to be a distinct place where we go. It's called the New Testament church. Yeah. Amen. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, every night of the revival. If it's happening at church, Hebrews 10, 25, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as a matter of some is, but exhorting one another. And so much the more, not less, not less, so much the more, more church, not more cell groups. Cell groups sound like a prison ministry to me. Amen, friend. Small group, my hind leg, friend. When the world is wisdom, do not God. It please God through the foolishness of preaching, 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 preaching. And preach the word. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Paul said, for as much as is in me is, I'm ready to preach the gospel. The work of God ought to be focused around this piece of furniture. This is the focal point of North Valley Baptist Church. Oh, it didn't cost as much as these pews. It surely didn't cost as much as these nice pianos. But I guarantee it's most valuable. This is, this is the most valuable, this is the most valuable piece of furniture on this property. The work of God. There'll be an allegiance. This statement, stand until he comes, reveals an allegiance to a divine purpose. Find out what God wants you to do. Get busy about doing what you're supposed to be doing for God. Find God's perfect will for your life and stay after it with all intensity. I think about it, 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 it involves depraved people. The ministry is about people. People. I, I'm, I'm disturbed by what I'm seeing in this younger generation. Some of these older men who are falling suit like some kind of a Pied Piper, they're following these liberals and moderates into a mentality that they're untouchable. I mean, church is over, you got to go run and hide. Let me say, you're not Dr. Howells. You had not had many threats on your life. People think, oh, well, you have to have an appointment. Don't y'all, don't, don't look down like you lost a quarter. I don't know who to come preach to. When you got 70 people in your church and you got to have appointments, why can't you just go see somebody, man? You're not that busy, sir. 
Sir, you are not that, what you need is a second job. Amen, friend. Hey, what you need is a second job. You're not that busy. That's why you're falling into sin, messed up all the time, stuck on Facebook and computer, amen. Hey, stuck on social media. Hey, what you need to do is do some work with people. Visit the hospital. Go to the nursing home. Man, you ought to go to the hospital when none of your members are there. You just walk up down the halls and let the nurses know you're on call. You're just going to keep going to the emergency room and walk around and find somebody in tears and walk in many hours. I've been to the emergency room in the midnight hour. Couldn't sleep at night. Get up and drive down the emergency room and find somebody in tears. And I'm telling you, what an opportunity to evangelize. What opportunity to win somebody to God. But that's those people, you know. We ought to be standing. Standing with allegiance to the Word. Standing with allegiance to the Word of God. The Word of God. We, we, ought, we ought to define the Word of God. It's interesting if you, some of you closet Ruckmanites. Amen. Watch this. Y'all, yeah, I found one he didn't know. Psalms 16. Turn to Psalm 16. Thank God for the Bible. Psalm 16, there's 11 verses there. 16, 11. Psalm 16, how many verses in Psalm 16? Look at the first word in verse 1. Everybody repeat after me, what's the first word? What's the first word in verse 1? Look at the last two words in verse 11. Psalm 16, 11. Psalm 16, 11 verses. Look at the first word. In verse 1, what does it say? What's the last two words in verse 11 say? You say, well, that's nice to know. Yeah, that's not by accident, neighbor. Do you honestly, you think just by accident those great translators of the King James Bible, those great dividers of the the chapters and verses, you think that just so coincidentally fell together? If you do, you're brain dead. I'll tell you what we got. We hold in our lap the Word of God. Inerrant, infallible, impeccable, indestructible, indispensable. Amen. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled. Psalms 119, 140. Thy word is very pure. Therefore, thy servants loveth it. Y'all talk about in the ancient manuscripts, in the original autographs. You wouldn't know one if you met one. If you've got an authorized 1611 Bible, that's all you need, friend. That's all you need. We ought to define the Word of God. We ought to defend the Word of God. We ought to deliver the Word of God. An allegiance. We've lost our allegiance. You watch that crowd. Well, you know, we use the King James. What that means, they're not King James. Well, we don't, we don't teach, we don't preach anything but the King James. Well, that's good. But how do you believe about it? Do you have God's word in your hand? Do you have God's word in your hand? I wouldn't send. I wouldn't send a Shetland pony to a Bible college to learn woe, ye haw, and back up. I wouldn't send a poodle dog to learn how to go out to a Bible college that did not believe his King James Bible is the inerrant, infallible, impeccable word of God. I wouldn't recommend a college that wants to have in some kind of a scientist. When you go, when you go to his facilities, got the ESV you, and tries to correct the Bible. I don't care what he knows, how much he knows about creationism. Is everybody okay? Don't, don't look down. Don't look down. I was invited to preach here. Hey, don't look down, friend. I got an invitation to preach here. I'm so King James, it's pitiful. Hallelujah. Amen. Watch these young preachers ain't saying nothing. I'm watching young preachers sitting over there like, whoa. That's what I'm talking, they don't get it. If it we, we all, they ought to be about one, one or two times a service. We just all just... King James. 
days. About, about once every Sunday school hour, somebody ought to just say, whoo, 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 on the Bible. You're more excited about giving your name in the sword of the Lord than you are the Bible. Hey, man, wait, we got a Bible, friend. Allegiance. We got to stand till the king comes. I think that standing in allegiance deals with the word, the word, with the worship of God. Priority in your life ought to be church. The nucleus of every family in this room ought to be the, the church. The hub of all activity of a New Testament born again child of God ought to be a New Testament Bible believing fundamental premillennial independent missionary Baptist church. Period. Everything trumps church. Everything. Worship. It's not a bad word. You know, Jesus talked about it. You worship me, you're going to worship me in spirit and in truth. And that means when it comes to worship, you don't have your idea. You have a biblical format. Some churches emphasize spirit only. No word. Then we got these preachers that preach in word only. And ain't got enough power. I mean, it's, it's, it's it, no, no unction. They're doctrinally sound, but dead as a three o'clock in the morning. There's nothing more boring than somebody that knows the Bible with no unction on him. I'd rather somebody preach with broken English, can't even repeat, they don't have to pronounce the words, but it's got God on them. By the way, there is a big difference in that crowd. Paul said, I didn't come to speak to you in word only. He wrote it. He was a pimp. He was a dictate. He was dictating the word of God. But he said, I didn't just come in word only, huh? but I came in the power and the demonstration of the Holy Ghost. There is a difference. I don't know how you get it, but I know when you ain't got it. Amen. I'm not through. I'm trying to finish. The statement stand until he comes. We will not sit down. We're going to keep on standing. It only deals with allegiance, but it deals, it deals with awareness until he comes. Man, I, I, I was brought up, I remember my earlier formable years as a Christian was in the 70s, the early 70s. And man, every Friday night of every revival, somebody preached on the second coming. I mean, it's, I mean it was going to scare everybody to death. Friday night, Brother Mays Jackson would say, now be here, beloved, be to Friday night I'm preaching on what will happen when Jesus comes. I mean, I'm to, I mean every Friday night of every revival. I'm preaching Friday night on this subject. Don't miss it. What will happen when Jesus comes? Man, come Friday night. Man, I was so scared. We lived in Tucker, Georgia, DeKalb County. The railroad came right through Tucker, middle of Tucker. It crossed three times. There was three crossings every night. I mean, every night. And we lived close enough to that. Man, middle of the night. About two in the morning, here come L and M Railroad down through there, and I mean, wah, wah, wah. I'm thinking there it is, the trumpet sounded. <laughs> I'd run to my mama's room and daddy's room and look, make sure they're still in the bed. <laughs> We've got a generation they don't even fear the second coming. They they have no they have no concept, they don't get it. He is coming. This thing's real. It's sure. He's coming. It's a sure claim. He's coming again. It's a speedy claim in such an hour as you think not at the moment, the twinkle of an eye. It's a specific coming. Hey, let me say something to everybody in here. You may have your mama fooled. You may have your daddy fooled. You may have your pastor fooled. Hey, you may have your, your youth director fooled. You may have your husband and wife fooled, but you do not have the thief in the night fooled. He knows real jewelry from fake jewelry. He knows real gold from fake gold. He knows diamonds from cubic zirconium. Hey, hey, I'm telling you, he knows. He knows who's real. And these heretics want to come in with a mid-trib, pre-wrath. 
they're, they're as far. They're, anybody preaching that junk, is, I, I equate them to a bunch of Catholic. Amen, a bunch of worshiping idols. Amen, friend. Don't you die on me. I equate them to a bunch of false prophets like Calvinists. Calvinism straight out of hell. Calvinists think they're so smart they try to intimidate us. I go to camp meetings. A lot of the mountain preachers over in Russia, they, they're Calvinists now because they're lazy. Because they won't, they won't run buses. They won't knock on doors. They won't pass out tracks. They just, what is to be will be and everything. I always tell them, you Calvinists, I feel sorry for y'all. God didn't die for you. I had one of them what do you mean? I said, well, he came to seek and to save that which was lost. And according to your Calvinistic doctrine, you've been saved for the foundations of the world. You never have been lost. Then I told one of them the other day, y'all think God's stupid. You Calvinists, y'all think God's stupid, don't you? No, we believe in the sovereignty of God. I said, no, you don't. Sovereignty is God does what he wants to, when he wants to, any way he wants to, and doesn't have to get your permission to do it. That's what sovereignty is. Sovereignty is not predestined anybody to hell. That's a false doctrine. Like ordaining women preachers. Like a pre-wrath rapture. Amen. You don't have to like this house. Jesus said I'm coming. Amen. Watch this. You mind if I preach what the Lord? It's too late now. Watch this. I ain't through. Watch this. I said, I, said, I hate it for y'all. Y'all think, y'all think God's stupid. And the guy said, no, we don't. We believe in sovereignty. We believe in sovereign grace. I said, well, then who was hell made for, sir? He said, the devil and his angels. I said, God was so stupid in your mentality. He was so stupid that he only made hell big enough for the devil and his angels. That's why the Bible said hell hath enlarged herself. Every time somebody dies without Christ, it's got to get bigger. Because he never intended for anybody to go to hell. The reason why hell hath enlarged herself is every time somebody dies in rejection of the free pardon of sin, dies, hey, in an unrepentant spirit and unbelief, they have to enlarge hell, make it look bigger. But see, God was so, he didn't even, he didn't even realize how many people's going to be created, how many people's going to be born. Hey, that's, you know, now let me tell you something, that's, that's all false doctrine. It's all wicked. I ain't rubbing shoulders, somebody rubs shoulders, somebody rubs shoulders. He's coming back, friend. It's a sobering claim. It's a scriptural claim. Let not your hearts be troubled. That's not, that's, that's, that, let me say John 14 should not be isolated to funerals. Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you I'd go to a place for you. And if I go away, I will come again. I receive you unto myself that where I am there, you may be also. He's coming. I would not have you to be ignorant, Thessalonians. We don't sorrow as those that have no hope. We have a hope, Titus 2, 13, looking. Looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. We got to stand. We can't sit down. It's got, we got we to stand till the king comes. His statement was a statement of allegiance to David. His statement was a statement of awareness that David was soon to come. He didn't know when he was going to get there. He didn't know how far away the pasture was. He didn't know how, what time, but he knew this. He's coming soon. He's coming soon. We're going to stand. We're not going to sit down because he might be here just any minute. Y'all go get that eighth son. Go get David. Go get the anointed because he's going to, hey, we're going to stand till he gets here. It was a statement of annoyance. I can imagine. Y'all stay with me. I'm, I'm almost through. Is everybody okay? It's a statement of annoyance. Oh, Eliab's over there. Yeah, yeah. Abinadab. <laughs> I gotta go get David. Gotta go get David. Old country boy David. <laughs> out there in the field. Well, why do we gotta wait on David? I'm watching today as we preach truth and stand for truth that there's a crowd that's annoyed by it. We're still standing for something. You're here, you've identified with this conference because you identify what this, what this leader, this, this fundamentalist leader, this 21st century fundamentalist leader, you identified with what they promote and what they propagate, you're here. 
Some of you just might have showed up so you know you could get counted. So they're checking, you checked it off your list. So they'll, well, it, I went to the conference. You're going another direction. You just showed up. You didn't show up out of respect for him. You showed up for your reputation's sake, friend. I know what I'm preaching, bless God. You did it for you. But there's some who are annoyed by our position. That complacent one's annoyed because to stand means you got to admit your problem. To stand means you got to rise from your position. A stand, to stand means you got to arrest, uh, address the protesters. That crowd that you're trying to pull one over on, you know. Well, I believe the Bible and all in the originals. Well, I, you know, we believe in we believe in standards and everything. We're just not extreme. Well, the Bible never said. You know, we're not under the law. That shows how that shows how shallow that that crowd is. We're not under the law. We're under grace. That shows how shallow. It's harder under grace. Under the law, thou shalt not commit adultery. I got that. Under grace, if you look at a woman to lust after, you've already committed adultery. And you're an adulterer if you just look at a woman and say, look at yonder. Mm. Under law, all you got to do is just don't do it. Under, under, under grace, it's harder. Thou shalt not kill under the law. Don't kill nobody. I got that. Under grace, if you speak evil of a man, you're a murderer in your heart. You're already murdered. I'm looking at some serial killers in this building. Some of y'all need a life sentence or the electric chair. Somebody help me. They're strumming you, friend. The complacent. They're annoyed by our stand. Can I say this? When we think about this stand, it's an annoyance to, not only the complacent, but it's annoyed to the conflicted. A double-minded man's unstable in all his ways. They want to have it both ways. You know, blended services. We're having blended worship. We have traditional services, and then we have contemporary, then we have blended worship. Why don't you say we have a compromise service? We have a compromise service. God ain't within a thousand miles of that. You can't no more have Christian rock than you have Christian prostitution, Christian bank robbing, Christian drug abuse. Amen. Amen. To the casual. It annoys them, I understand. You know, it's going to cost you something to stand. Everybody ain't going to like it. There's a price. And the man who fails to plan, plans to fail. There's a plan if we're going to stand until Jesus comes. There's a presentation. The world's watching. It was during World War II. MacArthur was stationed in the Philippines. The island of Corregidor. The battle was at a heated point in history. Most of you know something about it. They began to bombard that island. I'm talking about the life of MacArthur and his staff and family was threatened, so he got on PT boats and they, two days' journey through stormy weather, through Brigades of uh, imperial soldiers with warships all surrounding them. God saw them through to safety. But when he left, he made this statement. He stepped on soil in Australia, in Melbourne, Australia, and he made a statement, I have come through and I shall return. He left there General Jonathan Wainwright in authority. He was the highest ranking general at that time. And 
the Imperial soldiers begin to bombard that island of Corregidor. I'm talking about it was an onslaught like really history has never recorded. Finally, after a long period of time, with very little retaliation from the Allied forces of the Philippines and America, Wainwright had to. Was it because he was a weak man? But he had to surrender. And he surrendered the Philippines into the hands of the Japanese. The Bataan Death March started. They took between 80,000, 60,000, and 85,000 of Philippine guerrilla soldiers, Filipino patriots, nationals, and, and around 60 something thousand of our own men. And they marched them on what they call the Bataan Death March. They were taking them to a place of torture. On that death march, thousands died. I think over 500 to 650 of our United States forces and 800 to 1,800 Filipino soldiers died on that march. It was tragedy. It's, it's, it's an awful time in history. War crimes were charged to the Imperial soldiers because of the cruelty Wainwright, who normally under Geneva Convention rules, a, a ranked general, a high position, would not have to go through the same, the same problems, the same mistreatment that soldiers did, but they made him march as well. An emaciated body. I'm talking about a place to where his sores upon every part of his body. He endured some things that he wouldn't even speak about. A 41-year-old veteran, 41 years that he served from 1903 until his retirement from military service, General Wainwright. One night in the middle of the night, in an August night, while he was sleeping in his hut, special forces had sent some soldiers in. And they came to Luzon there to that prison camp and they found the hut where General Rainwright was sleeping. And through the cover of darkness, they snuck up to General Rainwright's bed. His body was in such a position of decay, he had not stood. They say, the eyewitnesses say he had not stood for some weeks of time. His body was so weak. His body was so beaten down. His body was so deficient of nutrients that he had not stood for weeks. And while he was laying on his bed that night, he heard a voice, Psst, General Rainwright, we're officers from the United States. We wanted to tell you that in the morning, we're going to invade this island and you're going to be set free. Just hold on till the morning. The next morning, to the surprise of the Japanese soldiers who came, those guards came. When they got there, there stood General Wainwright, stood. And he had his uniform on. Under Geneva Convention rules, they could not take the uniforms. And he had kept that uniform pressed. He had kept it laying under his mattress. I mean, the collar was just right. The, the cuffs were just right. His brass was shining. I'm starting to feel pretty good about him. I said, <laughs> he had taken some grease that he had gotten off of a scrap of meat and shined his shoes. He had his hat and had his glasses on his face. And when those guards came to present him his breakfast, they handed him his rice and he kicked the bowl over <laughs> and stood at attention. And those guards knew something was different. He was aware that something was soon to take place. And within just a few hours, transport planes, big black transport plane began to circle that island and, and paratroopers, rangers, airborne rangers began to fall out of the sky. It looked like cotton balls falling out of the sky. And they lighted on that island and they freed General Rainwright. When they found him, they said he was standing at attention. Let me tell you something, friend. MacArthur fulfilled his promise. I shall return. For 2,000 years, the Church of Living God has been through the catacombs of Rome, and through the Inquisition, 
through modern day martyrment in New Guinea, through beheadingment over in uh, the, the Arab countries. But there's still a few of us left standing. Not everybody's given up hope. They said within that camp that many died not because of a physical disease, not because of some kind of outside influence, but because of a mental depression they could not bear. Let me tell you something. This is not all there is to it, friend. Jesus is coming again. To stand. Young man, I want you to stand. Second man on that road, just stand up right there. That's you with the glasses on. You stand. Stand up. To take a stand, I think about that word stand means it takes some strong men. You got to be strong to stand. S. T. A standing man will be a tested man. You'll never stand without a test. A standing man, A, will be an attacked man. Just our position as Bible believers, it opens the door to an onslaught from that crowd who disagrees. Take a stand is in, it's a noticed man. If somebody were to enter this building who was not involved in this service and they came through the doors, the first thing they would see was that man. The first thing that would stand out to that one who creeps in this service unaware of what's going on, that, that man would stand out. He'd be noticed. Can I tell you, if you'll take a stand in your town, you may be the only one standing but you'll be noticed. A standing man is a determined man. D, to stand makes determination. Nobody ever stands for God by accident. When you stand, you'll be rejected sometime by your friends. When we take a stand, we're going to be resented by our family. They, won't, they, they, just, they want us just to look the other way. They're going to, they're going to resent us. They may not even come to our services. When they come to town to visit, they may find, they're going to find a way to get out of it. You're going to be ridiculed by your foes if you take a stand. Yesterday, it was 24 years that my daddy passed away. 24 years ago on March the 5th, my daddy went on to be with the Lord. He'd be seated. The last 24 hours of his life, my sister Sherry was conscious enough to read tape what he said, and I'll never forget those things are indelible on my mind. In that period of time before he passed away, he asked me, he said, I'll make you promise me some things, son. And he said, go get Tracy. And I said, Tracy, daddy wants us in here. Tracy came in there. He took Tracy by her hand, took me by my hand, and he said, you promise me right now that you're going to stay married to her no matter what. And I said, well, I, I'm, he said, no, uh -uh. I don't say you're going to try. He said, you, you promised me I'm fixing to die. He said, you promised me right now that you're going to stay married to Tracy no matter what. And then he looked at Tracy and said, you promised me you're going to stay married to him because he ain't easy to live with. And then he looked at me and said, won't you promise me something? That you won't go another way. I said, I promise you. He said, tell me again. I said, I promise you. He said, tell me again. By then, I done got full. <laughs> I said, I promise you. He said, boy, it won't be easy. He said, it's a different day than when I pastored. He said, you got more competitors for your church than I had. He wrote you a letter like that. Can I tell you something? The stand's worth it. Because as it is, Ridiculed by your friends, resisted by your family. I tell you what, it's respected by the Father. Yeah. Old Stephen's getting rocked to death. He was, he was looking good when he was hardest hit. Getting rocked to death. And about the time the Lord stood, 
and allegiance. Let's stand together all over the house.